Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how often exercises should be changed to maximize muscle growth. First, we need to understand what impact exercise selection has on hypertrophy. Essentially, the exercises we implement are simply means to stress the muscle tissue. Our physiology doesn't recognize what exercises we perform, all it understands is stress and adaptation. Therefore, there are no single best exercises for hypertrophy. There are a range of different movements which can all be highly effective for each muscle group. So why should we even change exercises in the first place? Can we just stick to the same exercises in a training program forever and continue to make gains? This is a highly theoretical question, but I would say that you could keep the same exercises in a training program for a long time and still make progress. However, the reality is that we almost never have to do this. With modern gym equipment, we have multiple exercise variations we can perform to train each muscle group. Furthermore, equipment availability may change over the course of a trainee's lifting career, forcing us to try new exercises at certain points in time. So going back to the original question, why should we change exercises? Well, changing exercises provides some variation to training. It provides variation in both a physiological and psychological perspective. Let's now explore the effect of exercise variation on both of these factors. First is the physiological effects which basically means the impact on actual hypertrophy outcomes. Changing exercises induces variation in the loading pattern of the muscle. This may benefit muscle hypertrophy in two primary ways. First is the novelty factor. Changing exercises introduces a new stimulus that the trainee is unaccustomed to. Whether this is the first time the trainee is performing this exercise or they are reintroducing it into a program, it is initially a fresh stimulus for that lifter. While it is not entirely clear from a scientific standpoint, this may be able to spark some new gains since the body must now adapt to a new stimulus. However, we shouldn't expect huge gains to occur, it may simply provide a slight initial boost in muscle hypertrophy. This is related to the repeated bout effect. As we know, we have the fastest potential rate of muscle growth as a new lifter. This is because the entire concept of resistance training is a novel stimulus for us. Then as we continue to lift for multiple years, we can still make good progress, but our potential rate of muscle growth declines. So theoretically, if we were to introduce a new exercise, we may be able to replicate the newbie gains seen as a beginner lifter to some extent. Although introducing a new exercise is not completely novel, like it is when we first start lifting, it is still somewhat novel. So it might be able to spark an initial faster rate of progress if we have been performing the same lifts for a long time. The second potential physiological benefit that exercise variation can provide is changes in regional hypertrophy. This refers to hypertrophy at different portions of the same muscle. Performing different exercises for the same muscle appears to emphasize specific regions of the muscle to different extents. This study explored the effects of Smith machine squats versus leg extensions on quadriceps hypertrophy. It was found that leg extension training grew specific portions of the quads more, while the Smith machine squat grew other portions of the quads more. So as we can see, each exercise preferentially hypertrophied different regions of the quads. This provides a theoretical rationale that changing exercises over time may result in greater uniform hypertrophy across the entire span of the muscle. Next, let's move on to the psychological benefits of changing exercises. Muscle growth is a long and slow process, which can take decades to reach your own peak muscularity. Therefore, it is important to enjoy the process along the way to ensure we stay on track with consistent training over time. Exercise variation can play a positive role in this in two primary ways. Let's now cover what these are. The first is simply for enjoyment purposes. Changing exercises can provide something new to look forward to in your training session. While trainees probably shouldn't rely on exercise variations for enjoyment in the gym, it can provide a temporary boost in training motivation if you've been performing the same exercises for a long period of time. And the other psychological benefit of exercise variation is for focus and intent. When performing the same exercises for an extended period of time, it can sometimes become monotonous and we aren't completely in tune with what we are doing. 
We may know roughly what weight and how many reps we normally perform with a given lift, so we may subconsciously perceive this to be our limit. However, when we introduce a new exercise, we now have to be more focused and aware of our technique and our proximity to failure. It breaks the monotonous pattern of going through the motions and can make us more conscious of what we are doing. This may help us push a little harder with each set and make us consciously focus on our lifting technique. So now we know that changing exercises probably has some positive effects on muscle growth. Now the question becomes, how often should we change exercises? Well, essentially there is a balance. We don't want to change exercises too frequently, and we don't want to perform the same exercises for too long. So there is no real definitive answer, rather it probably depends on a number of different factors, which we will now cover. The first factor to consider is neural adaptations. This can be thought of as our strength efficiency, or in other words, how much weight we can lift with the given muscle mass we have. Neural adaptations improve and diminish quickly. This means if we aren't training a lift consistently, our neural efficiency won't be maximized compared to if we were training that lift multiple times per week. In other words, to be strong at a lift, we need to practice that specific lift. So when we introduce a novel exercise, we will usually see rapid improvements in performance in the initial few weeks of implementing it. However, this is not necessarily indicative of muscle growth. Rather, it is largely due to improvements in neural efficiency. So trainees may falsely think they are rapidly growing muscle mass, when in fact it is just initial neural adaptations occurring. This has implications for how often an exercise should be changed. Before changing an exercise, we want to make sure we have gotten past those initial strength gains. This is to ensure we are maximizing how much load we can stress the tissue with. If we change exercises before maximizing our neural efficiency, we are never truly stressing the muscle to our maximum capacity because the loads used or our rep performance is limited. The next factor to consider is somewhat related to neural adaptations, and that is lifting technique. Generally, it takes a while to make our lifting technique maximally effective for each exercise. We need to experiment with slightly different positions and joint angles to find what technique works best specifically for each of us at an individual level. In my personal experience, I have found better and better ways to improve lifting technique over years and years. So although technique development may be a long-term process, we still want to ensure we train a lift long enough to ensure technique is relatively effective. This may take a few weeks up to a few months for the exercise to really click, so to speak. Furthermore, sometimes coordination is a little rusty when introducing a new lift that you haven't performed in a while. For example, sometimes dumbbell presses feel a little wobbly after a long time off, or squats can feel slightly unstable and shaky initially. Therefore, we want to ensure lifters are performing the lift for long enough to ensure they are lifting in a coordinated manner. Another factor to consider is lifting performance. While lifting performance certainly doesn't have a direct correlation with muscle growth, it can be a good long-term indicator of hypertrophy adaptations. When a lift has been performed for an extended period of time, it may start to plateau at some point. While this is not necessarily an issue for hypertrophy training, it may indicate that the trainee is becoming accustomed to the exercise. Like we mentioned earlier, implementing a new exercise into the program may provide a novel stimulus that the body must now adapt to. However, this doesn't mean trainees should immediately change exercises if they don't improve lifting performance in a single session compared with the previous week. We are more so referring to a long-term performance plateau over a multi-month period. So if a lift has been plateaued for multiple months, then it may be time to change exercises. And the last consideration is mental monotony. Like we mentioned, performing the same lift for an extended period of time may eventually become less interesting. Lifters may find themselves just going through the motions with less intent than would be ideal. Often this is a subconscious phenomenon that we only realize in hindsight most of the time. However, if you catch yourself starting to feel disinterested with an exercise, then it may be a good idea to implement a new one. Furthermore, if you don't enjoy a specific exercise, then it is probably a good idea to change it anyway, even if it is not for any specific physiological reason. It is best to implement exercises you enjoy performing, as this is likely to naturally make you push harder and train more effectively. So based on all of this information, let's establish some practical recommendations. Free weight compound lifts are more complex in nature. This means that it takes longer to maximize neural efficiency and to really polish lifting technique. This is because there are many muscles and joints involved, meaning they have higher coordination and stability demands. 
This includes exercises like back squats, weighted pull-ups, and standing military press. Trainees should keep these exercises in their program for a minimum of three mesocycles and up to around eight mesocycles continuously. More stable compound lifts have lower stability demands and less overall musculature involved. This means neural efficiency is maximized sooner and technique develops quite quickly. This includes exercises such as the seated cable row, leg press, and machine chest press. Trainees should keep these exercises in their program for a minimum of around two mesocycles and up to around seven mesocycles continuously. And lastly, isolation lifts have the lowest stability and technical demands. So it doesn't take long to maximize neural efficiency and to develop solid lifting technique. Isolation lifts include those such as calf raises, bicep curls, and leg extensions. These exercises should be kept in a training program for at least one mesocycle and up to around six mesocycles continuously. It should be noted that these are very approximate recommendations, not rock solid rules. Trainees should use the principles we have discussed to individualize how often they change exercises. And finally, let's explore how this may look practically in a training program. Here we have 12 continuous mesocycles, which is equivalent to approximately one year, depending on the length of each mesocycle. We will explore how exercise selection for a back training session may change in each mesocycle across the year. As we can see, we have one primary compound movement, a secondary compound movement, a rear delt isolation lift, and a bicep curl variation. This session structure will remain the same for this example, while the exercises change across the mesocycles. So in the first mesocycle, we have pull-ups as a primary back movement, seated cable row as a secondary back movement, reverse dumbbell flies for the rear delts, and dumbbell curls for the biceps. In the second mesocycle, this may remain the same, as the lifter is not accustomed to any of these lifts yet. In the third mesocycle, we have replaced the dumbbell curls with easy bar curls for some variation for the biceps. In the next mesocycle, the reverse dumbbell flies have been replaced with the reverse pec deck. Nothing changes in the fifth mesocycle, as all exercises are still stimulative. In the sixth mesocycle, the seated cable row has been replaced with a chest supported row machine. The easy bar curls have been replaced with cable curls in the next mesocycle, and in mesocycle 8, the primary back exercise has changed from pull-ups to barbell rows, and the secondary lift has changed from chest-supported rows to a wide grip lat pull-down. So the primary lift is now a horizontal row, and the secondary lift is now a vertical pull. Nothing changes in mesocycle 9, as all exercises are relatively stimulative. In the next mesocycle, the reverse pec deck has been replaced with a reverse cable fly. In the 11th mesocycle, we have a new bicep movement again, the preacher curl. And finally, the wide grip lat pulldown has been changed to a neutral grip pulldown for some variation. So as we can see, the isolation lifts are changed more frequently compared with the compound lifts. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.